My name is Mickey Davis, and I have a global accountability for managed workplace services or digital workplace services for Unisys. But I wanted to step back and talk about Unisys for a second, because Unisys is a 150-year-old company, um, been through multiple changes, and the one thing I can say about Unisys is it's adapt adaptable. So 1986, we actually came up with the um, Unisys name um, after, and, and we were a mainframe powerhouse in 1986. Today we are a global IT outsourcer um, and security company um, globally. Now, Tom and I have the accountability for digital workplace services, so I'll talk a little bit about what we do, our complexity, and then Tom will talk a, bit, a little bit about our journey going forward. Who we are, we serve, you know, I have a team of about 12,000 people worldwide doing field services, service desk. And then if you just take that back, and it's about 4,000 service desk people, and that's what we'll talk about today. We're talking about our IntelliServe platform and our struggles there. And if you look at what we've done over the last couple of years with that, you say 4,000 people, you should be able to kind of make that work pretty well with the automation packages, the chat, the voice channels, everything else we're doing. Um, it's just we've had a little bit of a start and stop, and hopefully you guys will recognize some of the pain we've been through. So a couple of years ago, we thought, hey, self-help portals, chats, kind of generation one automation was the way to go. We did a lot of, spent a lot of money on that, a lot of time was put into that, um, didn't get a lot of results. So we really stepped back and we kind of looked at how we, why we did that and how we did that. And it was really build it and they will come, for lack of a better way of saying it. And if I step back and say, what did we do over the last year and a half in building our IntelliServe platform and where we're going with automation, it was really around making sure we got the business reasons on why we're doing this and making sure we're getting the best technology to build our platforms. And that's why we're partnering with IPsoft. Um, they are one of the best technologies out on the market. Um, we do serve over 300 clients with our service desk um, platform, and we range from 5,000 callers you know, 5,000 calls a month to 150,000 calls a month. So it's not like it's one platform that we're trying to solve for, it's multiple platforms. We did a lot of surveying with our customers and said, what are they looking for? And they're really looking for simple, simplicity, things that work. So if you think of the consumerization model, whether it's Alexa, Siri, anything else, they want that in their enterprise. And that is 100% our focus is to make sure whatever we do, our admission, is to make sure it works properly, because that generation one stuff left a lot of bad taste in people's mouth. So I'll talk about one more thing before I hand it over to Tom, and it's just really about our journey. So we're really focused on organizational change management up front with our customers, making sure they understand how we're gonna implement the technology. Two, we go through a phased approach. So we're putting Amelia across to every channel that comes in. So, you know, today when you look at our chatbot adoption, our self-help adoption, it's 9, 10, 11, 12% across the board. Our voice is still at 80, 85%. We're putting Amelia across all of voice also. So that's a big change. So we've got to talk about that with the clients ahead of time, make sure they understand how that's going to work. And it's a phased approach even then to where we're doing the low-hanging fruit, for lack of a better way of saying it, where it's, you know, you take those ITSM systems and take the four or five things that are the most common and we're focused on those. So simple things like opening a ticket, but if that drops two minutes off of my every agent's call, but if you do that, multiply that, um, you know, times 30, you know, 3,800 agents, it adds up pretty quickly to where they could focus on actually solving bigger and better problems. So with that, I'm gonna give it over to Tom, let him talk just a little bit about our platform, where we're going and our, in our opinion on how, how we're gonna get there. All right, thanks. Um, so, service desk. Uh, say service desk, a little bit different than your traditional call center. Um, the majority of our clients were internal focused in enterprise IT. Now I say that because when you hear 4,000 agents, it's 18, about 18 million uh, contacts a year. Um, and so when you look at that size and scope, the thing about it makes it so complex is the, is the thing that we can be called about toilet paper in the restroom. Yes, we have had customers, we've had to do that for, uh, open tickets up, um, all the way to, you know, network, your, your backend infrastructure, applications, things of that nature. Um, and so the, what ends up happening is we started going down the, like Mickey was talking about, uh, self-help portal strategies, uh, getting users uh, to go to a portal um, and then from there, um, if you're talking about ServiceNow, a workflow management tool, 
being able to automate the workflow and then automate on the back end whatever action uh, needs to take place. The problem is adoption. Um, and so when you go in and you build a, a contract with a, with a customer, pricing model, of course they want to see that price go down over time uh, based on efficiency gains. Um, so what was happening in, in our industry, it's not us, it's, it's just across the market, what happens is, is you build in those efficiencies and you build in those price decreases over time based on adoption. Okay, so I can go and put automation in, I can spend time and money on automation, but if the users don't adopt it and don't use it, then I'm not going to be able to reduce my head count or I'm not gonna be able to get more efficient. So what happens, you get to about year two, two and a half, all of a sudden the customer and I have to have a very real conversation about, hey, the adoption is not where we expected it to be, you have some responsibility and accountability in that, um, and therefore you get into the contentious back and forth negotiation at that point. So what we decided to do, um, and it starts with the commitment of our, of our leaders, but we've decided to completely take adoption off the table. And that's the primary reason that we said, okay, we're going to take Amelia and we're going to put her across all channels. Um, so that way we can focus on the back end, on the automation of the processes. Um, and then instead of getting a user to go to self-help, we are going to bring self-help to the user. So, um, some, you know, and originally some of this discussion was around millennials, but the funny thing about it is my dad turns on his, his lights on and off with Alexa, right? Um, and he's, he's not a millennial. Uh, my kids actually uh, are, don't want a camera in the house because they think that's weird and somebody's gonna break into it. <laughs> so at the end of the day, it's really not a gener generational thing that we're trying to achieve. It's people just wanna get their issues resolved. I just wanna get back to doing my job. I don't, don't make it, I think somebody said, uh, you know, I was talking about earlier about we expect in the enterprise that uh, users can know all of the different ways that they can access help or get help or what the processes are and, and you just simply don't. That's why uh, voice is still the number one contact method in the enterprise industry, uh, uh, service desk. Mm -hmm. Password resets with all the automation that's out there and everybody, it doesn't matter who you talk to, oh, it's easy, yep, okay. Why is password reset still the number one contact type? And, uh, and uh, just out uh, at least 90% if not more. Uh, of, the, of the organizations. So as we sat down and we said, okay, we're going to put Amelia there. We need to be able to automate uh, and drive that automation. Now somebody also brought up while ago, as a global company, well, you've got GDPR requirements. Um, you've got different regulatory requirements in different countries. Um, and even looking at, well, what are we gonna do um, if, so like the state of California is coming up with different types of policies and regulations. What, is that, what happens if that becomes every state has a different type of regulation? So that, that was one of the big things that we sat down, challenges we had to look at and say, okay, how do we scale this out? Do we build it out by region? Do we build it out um, just as a global model um, and, and just not fit with certain industries, which is not uh, practical and it's not, you know, not a good business model for us. So we had to sit down and architect based on regulations first. The second thing um, that we found challenging um, is, uh, is really the translation uh, or the different languages uh, across voice. Digital, most, most providers are able to do digital fairly easy. Um, but when you start to say, I'm gonna take and go across voice, an analog voice channel, um, it gets very complex at that point. Um, and so that's, that's another thing that we've had to be really careful about. Um, you know, English and Spanish, for the most part, uh, cover about 85, 90% of our business. But here's the thing, as a customer doesn't want to hear, you're only, you're only covering 90%. Um, you know, if I have certain languages, uh, they, those people still need support as well. Um, so we've had to, to really uh, keep our eye on the ball there and um, continue to push forward. Um, I think speed, speed to market or speed within, uh, within the organization. Um, everything that we're talking about has really not been done holistically like we're talking about doing and how we're doing it. Um, the one thing is I think about two to th even two, three years ago, if, I, if, you, if I'd even mentioned that we were gonna put 
Amelia on the front end and it will be the very first point of contact no matter how you contact us and it will open up all tickets. Um, people would have been like, yeah, we're not ready for that. Um, when we started talking about this over a year ago uh, and started implementing it, um, it's been interesting. Not one customer has even brought that up to us. Um, they've been very excited about the idea of being able to then expand it out from not just service desk, but many of the IT organizations are starting to find that the different business units are going and doing their own uh, different implementations, uh, smaller RPA implementations or uh, different types of AI technologies and they've got all these little pockets because IT is not moving fast enough. Um, and so that has been another uh, area that the customers have said, hey, okay, if you have this implemented uh, from my service desk, how easy it is it to then branch it out into the other parts of the organization where they're building their own stuff. Yeah, I think I would say the, the one store is going to really help us enable that, right? So we, if we can have that available for our customers to play with and look at, that'll just enable the rest of the business to be on the platform, which is going to be very helpful. Yeah. So um, the, the, the one other thing, someone, someone brought up earlier about pricing mechanisms too. So we do have separate pricing mechanisms for this. So you know, today, traditionally, you might get a price if you put your desk in India, whether you do it in the Philippines, China, whether it's the US, you're gonna have different pricing. Here, we actually price by digital channel also. So if you do an automated resolution, it might be you know, 20% of what a voice, you know, a live agent's gonna do. So we'd actually price it per region by digital channel and by live agent. And so this is, and I know, so when you start looking at it, you say, well, service desk, you know, you look at the Kager, what their predict, you know, what the predictions are now. Um, we don't, we're looking forward. Um, and when I say that, what we're doing is we've started at the service desk and we're implementing it here. Um, but within the portfolio is, of course, field services with dispatch and on-site. We also have unified endpoint um, and collaboration services and things of that nature. What we're doing is this is becoming our, the basis for how we will do everything moving forward. Um, an well, example of... I was going to use one example would be we have an organization that supports our field services. So we have 7,000 field service techs around the globe and I have a back-end organization that supports them. They do about 10 million interactions a month um, and we think we could probably automate about three to five million of those you know, through, with Amelia. So there's a lot of other areas we're looking at. We're looking at predictive analysis on, on the devices themselves out in the, out in the world. So got a lot of things planned, but we've got to get, you know, kind of phase one done, which is kind of the service desk. Which will really allow us to move into pr true proactive uh, resolutions. So end user experience monitoring as a, as a service offering we have, um, which is, is great, right? But where, what we need to get to is once we identify that, so let's say a user is trying to log into an application or because we see it by IP address, we know that IP address is a certain SaaS application. They try to log into it three times. Um, why should I wait for that user to call into the service desk and say, hey, I'm locked out or I can't get in? If I notice that, how come Amelia can't call that user and say, hey, I'm noticing that you are having problems getting into this application? Person says, yes, okay, can I help you reset your password? Or you know, whatever the case may be. If the user says yes, that's great, that's very helpful. But here's the deal. If they say no, we just identified a security incident, potentially. Um, and so with the algorithms and the, and the security and the way it works around behavior analysis and it's looking for large trends, well, if we're able to start feeding in information as such as that, a possible uh, breach, then now we're, we're facilitating that security aspect of the organization as well. Um, so that's kind of the, the, some of the, the areas that we're looking at as we start to branch this out because what we're, plan what we're getting and gearing up for is uh, embedded IoT. That's, that's the big prize down, down the road um, that when IoT starts to become embedded, there's going to be another even more uh, uh, advanced uh, detection, tons of data coming in. Now how do you get proactive uh, in that area as well? Um, so this is really our step one building block. Yeah, the, only, the only thing I would add around step one is really we're also developed, a, developed an app too. So if you think about how you want to interact or how someone wants to interact, I'll use one of our convenience stores that we manage. They're, they're, those folks there are busy. They don't have time to engage. So what we did is we developed an app that needed to go on a phone, go on a laptop, but also on a point of sale device. So that point of sale device, they could actually be working with a customer and actually be working with us in the background. 
and or if, if they're driving in their car, they could actually interact with us via voice. So that will work either way. But we wanted to give them multiple, all the channels, but with one back end mechanism, which is, Amelia is gonna be on the front of that. And some of that's around actual behavior, user behavior. So when we started developing the app, we actually brought in a, another partner and that sat down and what they, that's what they do is they build actually websites uh, for uh, customers um, at, that will drive revenue, right? And so we sat down and got to talking with them about the psychology of users, what they've learned about what works, what doesn't work. The thing about it is, if you look at it, it looks very much like a portal. And the first thing you're gonna say to me is, well, wait a minute, I thought you said you're moving away from a portal strategy. Yes, but people are not completely comfortable right now with just saying I'm going to talk, um, uh, just talk to a, a virtual agent or artificial intelligence, right? Um, so we give them that ability to say, hey, if I wanna go search a knowledge base, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, I can all do it from this app. But the thing about it is, is that as people become more comfortable with it, as it's running within the organization, then you start to pull these things away because why should I have to go to a portal? Why should I have to go search a knowledge base when um, the Amelia or, or the enterprise personal assistant is going to bring that information to me? Um, and so that was part of the thought around building the app was kind of that stair, to, uh, stair strip step approach around the matu up. maturity and the behavior uh, of users. <laughs>